Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Gen 2, your source for all things video game and tech related. I'm Keegan Cooper and I'm back baby. And I'm Tucker Hill. Let's get right into this week's new releases. You'll be able to see these games and many more released throughout the week on all your favorite platforms. This week we have a new game for the kids. Always nice to have a game for the kids. A Need for Speed remaster and a game about chicken police. Paw Patrol Mighty Pups Save Adventure Bay releases for the PC, PS4, Xbox One and Switch on November 6th. A fallen meteor has given the pups mighty powers and left Adventure Bay in a mighty mess. Now it's up to you and the pups to use their powers, rescue skills, and gadgets to make the town possum again. <laughs> possum, possum. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered releases for the PC, PS4, and Xbox One on November 6th. Unleash a savage sense of speed, both as an outlaw and a cop, in this timeless racing experience updated for today's platform. Get cross-platform multiplayer with auto log, enhanced visuals, and all the main DLC delivered at launch, and much more. It's time to reignite the pursuit. Chicken Police releases for the PC, PS4, and Xbox One on November 5th. A wild tale of love, death, chickens, and redemption, Chicken Police is a buddy cop noir adventure with a carefully crafted world, a gritty story, and lots of absurd humor. The game mixes elements of classic adventure games with visual novel-style storytelling. Do you want to be my chicken co-op buddy? <laughs> <laughs> These games and many more will be releasing throughout the month, so be sure to be on the lookout for them. Up next, check out X-Gen with Dalton. Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of X-Gen, the show where in lieu of the new consoles coming out in a week, I talk about games I really enjoyed playing on the current generation of consoles. This week we're going to take a look at 2014's Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor and probably talk about how it's the only piece of Lord of the Rings media I've ever really consumed. This game takes place during the 60 year gap between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Our story begins with Talion, who is a captain of Gondor stationed at the Black Gate of Mordor being captured along with his family by Sauron's Uruk forces. Uruks are kind of like orcs, except way worse. One of the Uruks, known as the Black Hand of Sauron, ritually sacrifices Talion and his family in order to try and summon the ghost of the Elf Lord Celebrimbor, who we find out later helps Sauron to forge the One Ring. Instead of merging with Black Hand, Celebrimbor merges with Talion, thus banishing Talion from death and leaving him to drift between the worlds of light and dark. From there, they head out in search of clues to help Celebrimbor remember his past, as he has one nasty case of amnesia, and of course to get revenge for Talion's family that were so kindly ritually sacrificed. The rest of the game sees you manipulating and killing Uruk warlords as you make your way towards a final showdown with the Black Hand and Sauron. The worms are in my head and they wiggle! Wiggle, 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 wiggle! Now I am a huge fan of the combat in this game. To me it really reminds me of Assassin's Creed back when the combat was more about sneaking around and assassinating people in one hit like it should be. The help of your homeboy Celebrimbor not only gives you some sweet wraith powers, but also makes you technically unkillable, which is why when you lose all your health you get to conveniently spawn somewhere close, but let's get back to the combat and wraith abilities. As far as wraith abilities go, you get a few options, and in, in my opinion the best wraith abilities are the one you can do out of your archer stance. You can pretty much just teleport to your enemies and take them out, or use the slowed time effect to really line up that long range headshot, or if you want to you can shoot some explosive barrels and you can really blow the opposition away. Throughout the game you get skill points to level up your combat proficiencies and wraith abilities. One of my favorite abilities deals with the hit counter. For every hit you land without taking damage, the meter goes up, and once you reach a certain number of hits you can instantly execute an enemy. But this ability of mine makes it so every time I hit that threshold I get two executions to use back to back, and I mean just look at these gory, nasty kills. That's some real good stuff right there. One of the wraith abilities is also that you literally drain the life right out of an enemy and take it for yourself, so uh, that's pretty helpful. So now, on to the story of how I accidentally saw the first 10 minutes of the Battle of the Five Armies in theaters. So I went to a Catholic high school, and around the same time Five Armies came out, Ridley Scott's Exodus Gods and Kings was releasing. And of course, our religion teachers loved a good movie about Moses and the Exodus, so all the religion classes took a trip to the theaters to see it. And it turns out, whoever was running the projector that day wasn't paying much attention and treated us to a little bit of a double feature, until they realized it was the wrong film and got us into some of that sweet Christian Bale action. Other than that in the games, I don't really have much Lord of the Rings experience, but we're getting way off topic now, so let me recenter this. Despite me not really caring that much for the franchise before this, I really enjoyed this game, so much so that its sequel Shadow of War is the last game I bought on disc. That was three years ago. 
I really enjoy the nemesis system in both these games. The nemesis system is where you kind of have to go throughout an area and get intel on the war chiefs in that area. With that intel, you get a general idea of their strengths and weaknesses and where you can usually find them hanging out. From there, you can either kill them or recruit them to your ranks. The game also remembers previous battles you have with them. Like, say if you burn an Uruk during a fight and they get away from you, the next time you run into them, they might be wearing a bag over their face to cover their scars. Or when one kills you, they might get powered up and get promoted within the ranks of their army. Overall, I found these games really enjoyable and a fantastic time to play, even for someone like myself who isn't incredibly familiar with the source material. That's going to do it for me this week on XGen. I will see you guys next week. Hello, and welcome to Steam on a Budget. I'm Drew, and this week I'll be covering the esports sensation of a game, Counter-Strike Global Offensive. CSGO is a team-based arena shooter where two teams fight to either plant or defuse a bomb. It uses a slower-paced combat system that favors precise aim and movement. I personally have trouble recommending this game to friends because of the steep learning curve that comes with it. It is very easy to give up and drop the game without putting much time into it, simply because the game's mechanics can get annoying. First, let me go over the good. The best thing about this game is the gunplay. The game feels really good when you're able to land shots. Every kill feels like an achievement when you're first starting the game. The way each gun works is slightly different as well, so when you're learning the mechanics it's fun to see what certain guns feel like to use. I also like how they made the knife really difficult to use. It makes knife kills extremely hard to get, but also makes them extremely rewarding. So it's always cool to see them in games. Another feature of the game I think is great is the team aspect. The game is best played with a team comprised of friends. Nothing is more fun than partying up with the boys and playing a few games. It also helps with the competitiveness of the game. You always do better when you communicate. Even without friends, the game can be super rewarding if you talk to your teammates. While they can get a bit rowdy, they will be a great assist to get the dub. Lastly, the community. The game's player base is practically immortal. The game is quite old, and it is still getting updates and has a thriving esports scene. And the player base is just as massive as it was when it started. There will be no trouble connecting to games and finding matches. Another great feature about this game that is that since it's old, it can run on almost anything. It is easy to get your friends to play, even if all they have is a laptop. Now, let's go over the bad. This game has microtransactions out the wazoo. Now it is a free to play game, so it is somewhat understandable, but it is annoying to see them every five seconds. Also, the game's difficulty may be somewhat too difficult for a lot of players. I personally can barely play the game just because it's so hard to get good. Another problem that a lot of people have with the game is that this is one of the games that kind of started loot boxes. It has a crate system where you have to buy keys to get skins and it's randomized, and a lot of people are very much against that, including me, but it is not necessary at all uh, to the gameplay experience. There no, uh, nothing but cosmetics are in these boxes, but it can be something that a lot of people will dislike. Overall, I'd say the game is a fun-to-play arena shooter that is a thriving community despite being a bit old. I think the game's flaws can be overlooked because of the free price tag, and I'd say it'd do good to be in your collection. This is Drew, and thanks for watching Steam on a Budget. What is going on, everyone, and welcome back to a brand new week of Tuck Talks. This week, uh, everyone's been going through a tough time, I feel like. I feel like uh, we got a lot of stuff on our mind, you know, elections next week. Uh, we got a bunch of COVID still going rampant, especially here in Maryville. Uh, and so this week I thought I'd just kind of just like make a chill episode, just where one where we just chill out, hang out together, and we all get behind something that everyone loves doing. This week I thought we would uh, just fish in Minecraft, just have a good time, and just, just relax, you know? Nothing too special going on. It's just me, my spruce boat, a fishing rod, the open water, and some Minecraft soundtrack music, but that's besides the point. So without further ado, let's get right into it.
that's going to do it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with me in my boat. We are just chilling, just having a good time. And who knows? Maybe we'll chill together some other time. Have a good week, guys. Peace. Hello everyone and welcome to High Fives, the show where I shove my unwanted opinion on video games into the mix and put them in a top 5 format. With the hit show The Mandalorian finally releasing its second season, fans are excited as to what Jon Favreau will do. In celebration of this, why don't we also take a look at some of the franchise's hit video games too. Like last week, because there are just so many Star Wars games out there, we're only going to be covering three. In that case, we may as well rename the show to High Threes. Lastly, there will be spoilers for some of these games, so you have been warned. Now with that out of the way, let's get started with today's list on my top 3 personal best Star Wars games. At number 3 we have Star Wars The Force Unleashed. This single player beat em up styled game takes place in a completely new story in which Darth Vader comes across a young boy with a very strong connection to the Force, taking him as his apprentice. This boy's name is Galen Merrick, however in the game he goes by Starkiller. As you play as Starkiller, you're tasked with hunting down and eliminating some of Vader's enemies. However, the deeper you get into the story, the more Starkiller realizes how awful Vader and the Empire are, later choosing to defect to the Republic. When you start the game, you're joined by two crewmates on your ship, one being Juno Eclipse, your new pilot, and the other being your combat training droid proxy. Oh, I hoped that using an older training module would catch you off guard and allow me to finally kill you. As you progress through the story, you can also unlock different things such as abilities, costumes, lightsaber colors, and more. This game is an extremely fun story-driven experience that if you're looking for some nostalgia and intense gameplay, then I could not recommend this more. At number 2 we have LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga. The LEGO Star Wars games have and continue to stand the test of time, having tons of people still playing different iterations of it to this day. On top of that, the franchise still continues to put out new games after 15 years. However, my personal favorite is The Complete Saga. This game was the first LEGO Star Wars game to have all 6 original movies put into one package. In this game, you essentially play through more child-friendly versions of these movies, either by yourself or with a friend. Throughout these stories, you can discover and collect tons of secrets that can be used to unlock characters like Indiana Jones, extras which are basically cheat codes, and customizations. Another fun element of this game is that it was the first to introduce custom characters. With this, you can mix and match different pieces of characters together to create a completely new and playable one. Because of all this content, this puts LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga in at the number 2 spot. And finally, at the number 1 spot, we have... Star Wars Chess. Just kidding. At number one, we have 2005's Battlefront 2. While EA has attempted and created a copycat trying to capture the perfection that the original had, it still was influenced by what EA does best, that being implementing outrageous gambling schemes into their games. However, the original Battlefront 2 was made under Pandemic Studios, and they did a fantastic job. In this sequel, they essentially added and fixed content that was in the previous entry, which in of itself was already good. However, they took this game a step further and added things such as ship to ship battles, refining tons of the game mechanics, and adding game modes such as heroes versus villains as a more casual and fun way to play. The gameplay itself, despite looking outdated, still holds up to this day. The world building, the gameplay depth, and combat all make this Star Wars experience truly feel like you are a soldier in that universe. With all that being said, this puts the original Battlefront 2 in at the number one spot for the best Star Wars game ever made. Thank you all very much for watching this episode of High Fives. My name is Chris Young, and may the Force be with you, always. Welcome to this week's Virtual and Reality. I'm your host, Derek Campbell. This week I played some ping pong in the reality, and on the PlayStation 4 I played the game Table Tennis that was developed by Savic Limited. So let's jump into some gameplay now to see how I did. In my first game that I played, I easily got the ball past my opponent's paddle on multiple occasions. My opponent had some pretty slow reaction skills in this first game that was played. I was also able to put spin on the ball that would curve so beautifully away from my opponent's paddle and land on the side of the table. I only allowed them to score two points on me due to me completely whiffing on the swing and missing the ball. In this first game though, I was able to single-handedly take the win. In my second game, I got wrecked by a much harder opponent. 
I think I was a little cocky after my first win and couldn't get anything past the opponent that I was playing. I would miss the table on some of my hits after we had some good back and forth volleying going on through the game. My opponent was though scoring left and right against me and I couldn't get anything to land but did eventually score two points against them. I think that I did pretty good in the game as a player, I just couldn't get some of my shots to land and I couldn't hang with the tougher opponent that I played. Well, that's it for in the virtual and I'll be in the reality up next. Alright, I just got done in the virtual. I'm here in the reality and I'm going to be playing a ping pong against Kaylin. Kaylin, I'll see you at the table. Let's get to it. In the first game that Kaylin and I played, I jumped off to a quick start. I was able to place the ball pretty well on the table after some key back and forth balling that we had. I was also able to return the ball on some of Kaylin's good serves that she had. I did give up a couple of points to Kaylin though in the first game that we played. Kaylin got pretty mad after that game and I think that she was pretty fired up for our second game too. In our second game Kaylin came to play after that big defeat in the first game that she had to me. She was aggressive at the table and, was, and I was just trying to keep up with her. It was close one throughout this game. It was going back and forth on scoring. We both were serving and returning the ball pretty good. We also had some great volleys in this game that just made it even better to play in. It just wasn't enough though for Kaylin. I did up winning by two points to take home my first ever virtual and reality win. Kaylin may say that I cheated, but I think it was all skill. All right, we just got done playing and I, I think I did pretty good. Kaylin, how do you think I did? How can you say that, Kaylin? It was pretty good. You, you know you, what? You, you, don't, you, you don't, the only reason you won is because you <laughs> my glasses beforehand. You see, I normally wear glasses, but he just took that ping pong thing and just whacked it, broke him. I, I have evidence. I'm sick of this. You know what? I'm, wow. I'm, I'm sorry you think that, Kaylin, but uh, I'll see you guys next week. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Project Delta. I'm your host Dalton Spies, but you already knew that. With me this week we have eSports, a Northwest eSports member. Noah Hufford. And Noah is a member of the eSports uh, Rocket League team. So um, of course this week we're going to be playing Rocket League, which came out in 2015. It's, it's had a, a, a lot longer life than I think anybody really expected. It's, you know, five years later and it's still going pretty strong and not many titles do age this well. So it's interesting to see a game like this have such a big competitive scene um, even like you know this late into its life um, but Rocket League went free to play in September of this year so do you think um, during this five years after its release um, that re making it free to play do you think that was a move just to try and breathe new life into um, its player base and get more people into Rocket League? Uh, absolutely over the years Rocket League's just been getting bigger just from the esports scene itself, but free to play was definitely a great move on their part. It definitely has made the player base a lot bigger. I'm pretty sure it's about ten times larger than it was before on a daily basis. That's that's definitely like cause ten times. Like that's a huge uh, boost. You know, even just like going from say ten thousand people were playing a day up to a hundred thousand like that's just a huge jump and um so i want to know how long have you been playing rocket league i've been playing about tw since 2016 i'm pretty sure early 2016 about season three season four we're in season 15 right now and so what is it that really like uh interested you in rocket league is it just um the combination of soccer and cars or what what really um got you interested in it uh, what got me into it was I saw the competitive scene and it looked really fun and I picked it up just to try it and I've just been playing it ever since. Mm -hmm. And um, is Rocket League the only game that you play competitively or are there uh, any other games that you, you like to sink uh, your time into? I just dibble dabble everywhere. Rocket League's number one but I like to play a little bit of Rainbow Six Siege every now and then and just play some games for fun. Yeah, uh, I know like me, I've always been a, a huge fan of Overwatch ever since it came out. And, um, I, you know, it's it's been out since like 2016, so it's been a solid four years, but I feel like 
a lot of people do still play it, but I'm, I'm definitely waiting for Overwatch 2 to come out, so there's a lot more new content, new stuff for me to play, just because I, I, I am kind of getting tired of it. Yeah, for sure. And um, I think just a, a big whole batch of new content is exactly what it needs. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what is it that got you into esports and on the Northwest esports team? Um, I think I just liked playing competitively, and I saw that I was good at the game, so I was like, I might as well try it. And I've been going ever since I got here. And what's the, what's the process of getting on that team? Do you just have to know somebody? Is, are there tryouts that you have to go through? Are there um, like maybe like A teams and B teams? Uh, what's that kind of like? What's that process like? Um, well, I, we went to the organization fair. I saw the eSports group, and they were just looking for any games that people wanted to form some teams on. I was like, hey, I want to do Rocket League. And we found some other players I wanted to as well. And we just created a team with whatever best players we had. So you are kind of like one of the one of the founding fathers of the uh, the Rocket League team in, in Northwest, huh? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it about Rocket League that really scratches your competitive edge? Um, for me, it's just the ability of like being able to see what you do back. Like these replays, you get to see everything, everywhere. There's the replay function and the goal cam. You just get to see what you do, how well you're doing with your team. Mm -hmm. So does that help you a lot with, say, um, like making sure your positioning's correct? Do you ever like, um, it's, I mean, it could, could be even something like, you know, film study, like professional sports teams. Do you like football teams or anything like that? Do you ever go back and watch your games just to see how you played and what kind of spots you could have or should have been in? Yeah, actually me and my two teammates, we actually go after our uh, matches that are streamed on Thursday, we actually go back into the VODs and we watch back all the games from a, from a spectator perspective and we see what we could probably have done better. Now that, that, see, like, that, that's just the extra kind of steps that I feel like in any game you play where if you go back and maybe watch a recording of you playing when you're not, you know, in the heat of the battle and doing all this stuff that you can kind of take a look at that stuff with a clear mind and say, you know, maybe I should have done this, maybe I could have done this to help my team win. Yeah, for sure. And so um, what does your schedule look like as a member of the eSports team as far as practices, matches, and maybe even tournaments go? Um, well, for us on Tuesdays, we have practice uh, usually just later in the night. And on our Thursdays or Fridays is our games. Depends, we have to schedule it with the team. It's not a set time. And then whenever we play tournaments, we just find a time when we all can get on and we play the best we can. And so when you guys play um, games or tournaments, uh, is it usually, are you all in, uh, in one place, kind of like a LAN party, or can you all just kind of play in your own space, like maybe in your room or, you know, at a desk or something like that? Uh, we try to go to the eSports lab and play there. And since the internet's a little bit better there, we play on a LAN connection, mm -hmm. better computers. But if we have to, we'll play at home and just do whatever we can to play. And so, um, obviously, we've been talking about this entire time, Rocket League's a very competitive game. So how, do you, how does the ranked mode compare to the casual mode? We're playing a casual mode right now because, um, you know, we, we don't want to be sweating too hard in the studio. These lights are hot, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's already got us sweaty enough, and we don't want to be playing competitive. But so, um, how much different? Do you, do you usually like spend your time playing casual matches just to maybe get warmed up and get ready for competitive? How do you? Um, typically... Oh man, what a goal. I just <laughs> want to bring attention to that, that sweet goal. We're going to watch in the replay. Just straight, like, almost from your own goal. Definitely the long range strike. But yeah, so... Um, well, I think casual, it's obviously a little bit more laid back. And you can have fun. It definitely depends on if you're playing with people or just solo queuing. Mm -hmm. so if I'm playing with people in casual, well mess around and just try to have fun, but if we're playing ranked, we're gonna sweat off a little bit and mm -hmm. try to do better. Yeah. But if I'm just playing competitive by myself, uh, typically you wanna play the best you can. Your teammates will get on your back if you get one little mistake. Oh yeah, isn't it like that in every game? You know, you, you do bad and that, that little kid in the search and destroy lobby is yelling at you and talking about your mother. Yeah, all I'm, over. I'm sure Rocket League's the same way. But um, do you think it's too late for somebody to to pick this game up for the first time or 
do you believe now that it is free to play that it's a lot easier for new people to get into this game even if they don't have that experience? Um, I think this right now is actually the perfect time to pick up Rocket League. There's beforehand you had to purchase the game and a lot of people have already been playing for years and a lot everyone's pretty good but now that it's gone free to play there's so many new players and you'd fit right in. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and uh, load us into another match. Um, so obviously we just saw there's 2v2s and 3v3s. Are there any kind of interesting like uh, wacky modes that you can play in this game besides from just like the, the standard casual stuff? Oh yeah, for sure. They have, uh, they brought four different game modes. There's a game mode that's like hockey. You got a hockey puck. It's mm -hmm. really slidey. You got basketball. There's a game mode with power-ups. And then there's another one where you have to break the floor and put the ball through the floor. Oh, and that then, sounds like a great time. Yeah. And every now and then they bring fun little modes just for you to play. They're there for a limited time, so play them while you can. And so uh, before we go, I just want to find out where we can watch you guys play because of course we all want to support the eSports team. So where can we watch you guys play? What's your Twitch? Uh, maybe any kind of social media you guys have? Uh, well, you can watch us on Twitch on uh, Northwest NWMSU eSports. Okay. We'll be there. And that's also where we stream our other teams playing, our, mainly our League of Legends team. And then you can probably find me on Twitter at GuaraVII. All righty. Well, for Noah and for myself, Dalton, we will see you next time on Project Delta.